Good morning and welcome to Rising. I'm Amber Duke, joined by Noby Const. It's great Hello. to be here with you. First time at the desk. Thank Very you exciting. Thank so for having me. Absolutely. With less than 100 days to go before Election Day, Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump is getting real. On the money front, the Harris campaign says they've raised a whopping $310 million in July, $200 million of which was raised during the first week after she entered the race. The Harris campaign has outpaced the Trump team in the money race. According to the latest FEC filing, the Trump campaign raised less than Harris coming in at $217.2 million between January 2023 and June 2024. Meanwhile, the latest polling shows Harris is ahead too, but not by much. According to polling aggregate uh, Race to the White House, a collection of 128 polls reveals that Harris has surpassed Trump as of today. Harris is polling at 47% compared to the former president's 46.9%. Meanwhile, Harris's search for her VP is coming to a close. Several contenders cleared their weekend schedules, fueling speculation. Notably, Governors Josh Shapiro and Andy Bashir canceled planned events this weekend per Politico. Harris is holding interviews with her shortlist, shortlist of possibilities. Another contender, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, has not made any cancellations, but apparently is truncating his visit to Indiana. Politico is reporting that the Harris campaign told them she will hold a rally with her running mate on Tuesday in Philadelphia. And NBC News reported that the vetting team has met with Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, and Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. Okay, so the race is on. I, I mean, we have a couple of context clues here, right? The fact that she's holding this rally in Philadelphia would suggest that Josh Shapiro is involved in some way. Mm -hmm. It could mean that he's actually the selection. It could mean that maybe he's going to give his blessing mm -hmm. for whoever she picks. Um, but I really like him as a pick for her. I think he helps bring in sort of the working class white vote for Kamala. I think he helps her get rid of this perception that she is too tough on energy mandates, mm -hmm. particularly the electric vehicle mandates, and her past desire to ban fracking right. or to uh, to end coal jobs and things like that. Um, but he has a problem, of course, with the progressive base, which right. is that he's perceived as being too pro-Israel. It, it, not just that, also with environment. I mean, we we have to remember that not all coal, it, it doesn't just come down to coal jobs. Their fracking is a bipartisan issue in a lot of these working class uh, areas in, in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania in particular, and in Delaware and in other states along uh, that area where there's fracking. You know, it's a bipartisan issue where people are against it. It's not about jobs in the fracking industry as they import jobs from other states that has been proven. Um, it's about the environment. It's about drinking water. It's about uh, local communities rising up uh, to fight against fracking. And it would be a reversal to move in that direction given how much progress, even under Biden. I mean, he was against fracking. I mean, he was in 20, I think it was 2010, uh, came out against fracking in Delaware. So I think he, they have an issue with two different bases that are very important to keep the excitement up. Uh, it's a bet to trade a certain set of working class voters that might be a little bit more conservative on some issues for a base that they need excited that we saw how that was reflected in the polls when Kamala Harris was chosen uh, as the Democratic pick. Now, she doesn't want to lose that ground, does she, especially with the polls this close? So, I, you know, I think he's an interesting pick. Um, I'm leaning more towards he gives his blessing to excite the Pennsylvania base. Um, but I think that they need to go with somebody a little bit more progressive when it comes to working class issues and a vision moving forward. I'm a big fan of Tim Waltz. I think uh, the Internet is loving Tim Waltz. He's obviously shown on television that he can he can bring it home and speak to all kinds of voters, not just progressive voters. And that, I believe, is what uh, Kamala Harris needs in this situation. Yeah, and I definitely want to get into Tim Waltz and his record because he has been trending, especially among progressives, I've noticed in the past couple of weeks. But on the issue of fracking, I, I'm just curious, like where where Kamala gets off on changing her tune so shamelessly. I mean, in 2020, she said, I support banning fracking. Mm -hmm. Now she has campaign advisors running to the media to tell them that she doesn't actually mm -hmm. support banning fracking. She's also flipped on a whole lot of other issues. I mean, in 2020, she was ranked as one of the most liberal senators mm -hmm. to the left of Bernie Sanders, supported decriminalizing illegal immigration, supported potentially uh, disbanding ICE, comparing them to the KKK. Mm -hmm. She said that she wanted an electric vehicle mandate. Uh, she said that she uh, wanted to... Uh, to, uh, I already said decriminalizing illegal immigration, but I mean, on the border, of course, she has faced a lot of accusations that right. she's been soft on illegal immigration. So then you fast forward and now she's sort of running, trying to run at least more 
as a moderate. And I'm curious on your perspective on if that's a good idea for one, politically, yeah. if anyone's going to believe that. And then two, if she risks losing this progressive base by going too far to the center. I think that's all. That's always the calculation. I mean, welcome to politics. You campaign po in poetry and you govern in prose. She's not quite governing yet, but general elections are sort of a precursor to what an administration could be like. I, you know, I, I, I believe she's reversed her positions many times, even when she was running for president in sure. 2020, because her record, of course, in California is quite different than her record uh, in the Senate. And to be progressive in the Senate is not as much of a risk, especially from California. You know, am, am I worried about the environmental issues? Absolutely. I think the border is an ever-changing issue, uh, as we're seeing even border immigration is down right now. It is not what it was a year ago, two years ago. Uh, it's in, in, in a state like Arizona, especially if she chooses Mark Kelly, I think she'll be able to overcome uh, those issues a little bit more. When it comes to environment, yeah, I do. I worry about that. I think the environmental voters are large enough that they could impact this election in key states, and they are single-issue voters. Uh, when it comes to fracking in particular, you know, I, I don't like this approach, but I believe that in the past, advisors to the president, especially under the Obama administration, framed it from a geopolitical stance. We want to lessen our oil dependence on Saudi Arabia and other countries. Uh, this is a battle that the fracking issue is a battle geopolitically between Russia and the United States once more. So if she comes at it from that approach, she might be able to make her case a little bit more strongly. I don't agree with it, but if she wants to excuse why she's reversed her decisions, she better come up with some very good answers and very quickly. Yeah, that's what I think what one of her fundamental problems is going to be is, is she going to go with the tune that she was wrong then and, or she, either she's lying then or she's lying now <laughs> or maybe she actually has really evolved on these issues, which I don't think very many people will believe. But if she's going to go that route, she has to explain why she has changed so dramatically. And until then, I think that's a really healthy line of attack for the Trump campaign. Campaign mm -hmm. is to talk about the fact that you don't really even know what Kamala is going to do if she becomes president because she has changed her tune on these issues so many times. Unlike but, Trump. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is every politician right. flip flops to some extent, but I think it's a, a very neatly packaged narrative just because hers is so recent mm -hmm. and because she was so vociferous about these very progressive issues that she's now turned back on. But Let's go back to Tim Waltz, uh, because, I mean, you identified that he is more of an economic populist. He's very pro-labor. Um, but I think he has a little bit of baggage on some of the perhaps more cultural issues. Mm -hmm. He was quite slow to respond to riots in 2020, which uh, a lot of people in Minnesota were not thrilled about. Mm -hmm. He was pretty strict on COVID lockdowns. There was a lot of uh, pandemic fraud under his administration. He wants to give driver's license to illegal immigrants, or already has rather, said recently that he would help them by putting a ladder up on the border wall so they could climb over. Um, he has talked about um, uh, allowing men to participate in women's sports. And mm -hmm. although not all of these are top issues for voters, immigration certainly is. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a difficult thing for him to overcome, especially as Kamala is facing similar criticisms of her time as the quote unquote borders are. Right. No, you're right. Absolutely. I mean, these are when you look at the top tier issues. And again, if, if you're talking about exciting progressive voters, he's the guy by far. Uh, but if you're talking about winning over those those voters in the Midwest that seem to be, you know, the ones that are going to impact this election, maybe just by chance that he's from Minnesota, it'll overcome these other issues. But again, you're running against the Trump administration and, and the Trump campaign, excuse me, and the Trump campaign will not let these things down. They'll be running ads over and over and over again in these key states. And the Harris campaign needs to be prepared that whoever they pick, they are going to be putting these little minor notes on repeat over and over because, quite honestly, there's too much stuff to run against Trump and Vance at this point, and they're losing the narrative, so they're going to try to regain the narrative uh, by focusing specifically on those key voters. And Waltz probably has the best chance of winning over those voters in the, in the Midwest, uh, given his record on, on labor in particular. And I would lean into that. If I were the Harris-Waltz uh, campaign, which I hope happens, it would be labor, labor, labor all day long. Labor, labor, labor all day long. Um, immigration is important in those states, but labor is more important. What do you think about J.B. Pritzker? Um, I think they're going to have a tough time running away from the fact that he's a billionaire. Simple as that. Might be from Illinois, might be incredibly charming. He's you know, popular, charming, understands politics, but he comes from a billionaire family. So even though he's pro-labor, you think that just the perception of him being this you know, wealthy, pay-to-play guy would be too much? If I were advising the Harris campaign, yes. Okay, fair enough. Well, I know we're going to continue to follow this. Uh, 
I know the polls suggest Kamala is up by one point. Swing states a little bit different, but we're going to keep an eye on it. A lot more to talk about here on Rising. Stay tuned.